Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining this talk about dynamic convolution. My name is Christian Buza and this is a joint work together with one of my colleagues, Margit Anta, from the Department of Mathematics and Informatics of the Sapientia Hungaria University of Transylvania. In this talk, I will first explain you what is time series classification. Subsequently, I will show you a state-of-the-art solution for time series classification. In particular, I will talk a little bit about the so-called convolutional networks. After that, I will explain one of the shortcomings of the convolution operation. And finally, I will show you how we tried to alleviate this problem. So, let's start it. Time series classification is the common denominator of various recognition tasks, such as um, handwriting recognition, speech recognition, or medical diagnosis based on electrocardiograph signals. Now, I will explain you what is time series classification using an example from the domain of signature verification. In this example, we assume that there is a system and there is a user called Anna who has legitimate access to this system. And whenever Anna tries to log in to this system, she is supposed to write her signature on a touch screen. For example, on the screen of a tablet. While she is writing her signature on this touch screen, uh, some uh, properties of um, the writing may be observed. For example, we may obtain the speed uh, as the function of the time. We may obtain in every millisecond how fast Anna was uh, moving uh, the tip of the pen on the touch screen. Of course, in a realistic application, we could also obtain other information about uh, Anna's handwriting. For example, we could obtain the position of the tip of the pen in every uh, millisecond or in consecutive moments of time, or we may uh, acquire the pressure. But in order to keep this example simple, we will assume that we just uh, record the speed of uh, the tip of the pen in consecutive moments of time. And this gives us a time series like the one you can see in the center of this slide. Once such a time series is given, a so-called classifier is expected to decide whether this time series indeed was generated by Anna or perhaps by someone else. Now, in this case, Anna uh, wrote her signature herself on the touch screen, so the classifier would say that uh, this uh, signature is indeed uh, written by Anna, so we would uh, gain uh, access to the system for this user. However, it may happen that uh, some other person uh, tries to log into the system. For example, here is this user called Peter, and while he tries to log into the system, he is, of course, also asked um, to write Anna's signature uh, on the touch screen. Now it, we assume that Peter tries to log in into the system instead of Anna. And now Peter was successful in producing a signature which visually looks similar to Anna's signature. However, the dynamics of this signature is substantially different from Anna's signature. That is, um, this time series of velocities looks substantially different from uh, the time series that was obtained while Anna was trying uh, to log in into the system. And because of this, this classifier would now say that uh, this signature was most likely not written by Anna, so we would not allow this user to access the system. Generally speaking, uh, in this uh, application, we had two groups of time series. There were some time series which correspond to Anna. Uh, these are the time series that are obtained whenever Anna is writing her signature on the touch screen. And there are some other time series which are obtained whenever some other uh, users uh, write their signatures on the touch screen. And in this example, the task of the classifier was to decide whether uh, the signature is written by Anna or someone else. So um, the task of the classifier is to decide 
about a new signal. So here in the bottom of the slide you can see a new signal. The task of the classifier is to decide about this new signal, whether this belongs to the first group or to the second group. In general, in case of time series classification, we may have more than two groups. For example, uh, in case of electrocardiograph signals, each group of time series may correspond to a different disease whenever we try to uh, diagnose a disease based on electrocardiograph signals. However, in order to keep this example simple, we just considered two groups of signals, two classes of signals. You probably already recognized that um, this task of time series classification is a very important task because it is related to so many different applications. And because of that, uh, people developed various models, various approaches, various classifiers for time series classification. And uh, if you are interested in uh, these uh, classifiers, uh, you are more than welcome to study the literature. Here I only have um, the possibility to point out that um, state-of-the-art solutions for time series classification are based on deep learning. In particular, uh, state-of-the-art uh, solutions for a time series classification are very often based on the so-called convolutional neural networks. What are these convolutional neural networks and what is convolution? This is now illustrated uh, in the next slide. Um, as you uh, already know, Convolution, uh, in case of convolution, uh, we basically calculate um, a weighted sum. Um, for example, if uh, we are given this convolutional kernel, which you can see in the top of the slide, then uh, first this convolutional kernel is put it onto the first three uh, values of the time series and uh, using um, the uh, numbers in this convolutional kernel as weights, we calculate a weighted sum and uh, the result of this weighted sum will be uh, the very first uh, value of the convolved time series. Similarly, we calculate a lot of other weighted sums, and um, this way uh, we obtain this convolved time series. And uh, the interesting thing about convolution is that convolution acts as a local pattern detector. So if you have a look at this uh, convolutional kernel, this actually describes a V-shaped pattern, and um, this convolution is expected to detect a local pattern which corresponds uh, to such a V-shape. And uh, if you uh, consider this example, you can see that uh, uh, in this time series, this local pattern appears here, and uh, in the corresponding position of the convolved time series, the output of the convolution is uh, very large compared to um, the output of the convolution uh, at uh, other positions. So this convolution acts as a local pattern detector. And uh, in uh, state-of-the-art neural networks, uh, convolution is often followed by a so-called max pooling layer. And what happens in case of max pooling is uh, nothing else, but uh, we consider some uh, segments of the time series. So for example, we consider these first three values of uh, this convolved time series. And then uh, we just uh, take the maximum out of these uh, first three values. Similarly, we consider uh, the next three values. And again, we take the maximum, which uh, is that three. And uh, in the end, uh, we can take the maximum of the last three values, which is that two here. Of course, uh, in uh, real applications, uh, the window size is not necessarily three. So uh, in case of uh, max pooling, uh, we may use other max pooling window sizes, such as four or eight or two. But uh, in order to keep this example simple, here we just consider this uh, max pooling window size of three. Now, the interesting thing to note is what happens if uh, we shift this local pattern, this uh, uh, V-shaped local pattern, what happens if we shift this local pattern by one position either to the left or to the right? So first, uh, you can see what happens if we shift this local pattern by one position to the left. Um, in this case, uh, if you consider the uh, final result after the max pooling layer, if you consider the activations of the max pooling layer, then um, 
you don't see any changes. And this is uh, the expected behavior because the intuition behind using max pooling is that uh, we don't care so much where exactly this local pattern appears, but um, we only care whether this local pattern appears at all, and uh, we are only interested where it uh, appears roughly. So whether it appears somewhere at the beginning of the time series, somewhere close to the end of the time series, or somewhere in the middle. So that is something that we still care for, but we don't care so much for um, the exact position where this local pattern appears. So the aim of using this max pooling operation is to make uh, this convolution somewhat robust uh, against translations. Now, the question is, what happens if we don't shift this local pattern by one position to the left, but if we shift this local pattern by one position to the right? And this is what you can see in the third segment of this example. Now, if you do the same computations, you will realize that in the very end, uh, the result of the uh, max pooling layer, the activations of the max pooling layer, substantially changed. And uh, I think that this is a little bit of a problem, because uh, what we learn from this example is that um, convolution together with max pooling is, although somewhat um, robust against translations, but convolution uh, together with max pooling is robust in some irregular way. That is, uh, in the first case, nothing changed when we uh, move this pattern to the left by one position, but in the uh, second case, when we move the same pattern um, by one position to the right, uh, the activations of the max pooling layer changed. So um, this irregularity is uh, the problem that we uh, aim to address uh, in this uh, talk and in our work. And now let's see uh, how we did it. Uh, our proposal is to uh, replace the dot product in convolution by uh, dynamic time warping calculations. And uh, the reason why we propose to do it like this is because dynamic time warping, by definition, is uh, invariant to uh, minor local changes, to shiftings and elongations. And uh, this is why we think that it may be a good idea to replace the dot product in the convolution by dynamic time warping uh, distance calculations. Here, we don't have the possibility to explain the details of dynamic time warping calculation in detail. However, uh, you will find many, um, um, many excellent explanations in the literature, or you can also check out our source code where you will see uh, how we actually implemented these dynamic time warping calculations. Now, uh, after defining this operation of dynamic convolution, in which uh, Again, we simply replace the dot product by uh, dynamic uh, time warping calculations. After defining this operation of dynamic convolution, we want to use uh, this dynamic convolution in convolutional neural networks. And our proposal is to replace the first convolutional layer of a convolutional neural network uh, by uh, such a dynamic convolutional layer in which uh, we use this new operation of dynamic convolution instead of the usual convolution. I have to note that um, it may be a little bit tricky to train such networks. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't have the time to explain you the details of how such networks can be trained. But again, uh, you can read our paper or you can check out our source code and then uh, you will see everything uh, how uh, such a, a network with a dynamic convolution can be trained. So finally, I just would like to talk a little bit about the experiments that we performed. Uh, we performed experiments on uh, publicly available real-world time series data sets, and we considered two different network architectures. They were called NET1 and NET2, and uh, we considered two versions of both NET1 and NET2. Uh, in the first version, we used uh, the classical conventional convolution, whereas uh, in the second version, we used this new operation of dynamic convolution. We performed our experiments according to tenfold cross-validation protocol, and um, we used t-test in order to check whether the obtained differences are significant or not. 
and here is the link where you can find our source code if you want to replicate our experiments. Now, uh, if you have a look at the results, you can see that in, uh, the, in most of the examined cases, the network with dynamic convolution, this one, uh, outperformed uh, the network with uh, the usual convolution. And uh, due to this, uh, we consider our approach as uh, very promising. So, in order to summarize this talk, uh, here we introduced a new operation called dynamic convolution, in which we replace the dot product uh, by dynamic time warping calculations. And um, we performed experiments using this new operation within convolutional neural networks, and the results were very promising. Thank you very much for your attention.